I want to call your attention in light of all that's happening around us to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm calling this judgment in God's house. 1 Peter chapter 4. And let me read the last three verses, verses 17 to 19. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner. Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. The embassy in Afghanistan has been abandoned. In Kabul, we have retreated from that location. The embassy in Afghanistan was the presence of the United States on foreign soil. It represented our interest in a foreign land. It sought to serve our purposes in a place that was not in our best interest. But as things changed and as the Taliban advanced, it was determined that we would no longer maintain a presence there. There has been great celebration in Afghanistan about the fact that we are no longer present. Our influence over these many years are no longer retarding the aggressive movement of the enemy. And it has caught, caused great consternation even here about the methodology, philosophy, strategy, that is being implemented depended upon which side of the divide you happen to be on. But my focus today is on the fact that the embassy is empty. And that means that influence and leverage has been limited or lost. God has an embassy in history called the church. Amen. The church is God's embassy. It is his authorized location in a foreign land. The Bible makes it clear that this is not our home. But we have been temporarily situated here to represent heaven's interest in earth's chaos. That heaven has decided that it would have representative locations that would serve the interest of eternity in the location of time. That the church is not merely a place where people gather to worship as important as that is. It is also a place that people can get some information about heaven and how they should function on earth. The presence of an embassy bringing the thinking of the homeland into a foreign culture is designed to leverage influence, to let that particular community of people know that if you cooperate with us, there are benefits that accrue to you because of what we, the United States, have to offer in terms of freedom, in terms of resources, in terms of safety. The purpose of heaven's 
embassy in history. It's to let the broader society to know that if you follow these precepts, life will be better, families will be stronger, there will be a more ordered society. But what happens when the embassy shuts down? What happens when the embassy no longer feels that its presence is strategic and critical, not merely for itself, but for the environment in which it finds itself? The author of 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter, He makes this statement and he says in verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. The Greek word time is not chronos, but kairos. Chronos is clock time. It's tick, 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 tick. It's the chronology of time moving forward. But his word kairos, the word used here, means opportune time. It means time with a purpose. It means a special season. It means not time in general, but time in specific. That something is happening at this moment's notice to call your attention. It's Kairos time. It's time you need to pay special attention to. It's COVID time. It's time that you can't ignore because things are out of sync and out of order. When he says to the people he's writing in the first century, it is now time, you need to know why he said that. In 64 AD, there was a fire in Rome. The evil emperor Nero had set fire to a merchant's shop. That fire began to spread very quickly and it wrought destruction in Rome in 64 AD. It got out of hand. Things got so bad with the fire that Nero set that he had to blame somebody for the destruction. So what Nero did was he blamed the Christians for having started the fire. And he turned the Roman Empire against Christians. Now, he set the fire, but he didn't want the blame. So he had to shift the blame to Christians as being the ones who were bringing havoc into the society. You can look it up in your Wikipedia, you can look it up and it will talk to you about this fire set by Nero that got blamed on Christians. When it got blamed on Christians, there was an assault against Christianity and Christians found themselves suffering unjustly, unfairly, but suffering because the culture had turned against them based on a lie. It is shortly after the fire that Peter writes 1 Peter because the Christians found themselves in an untenable situation of persecution. People wouldn't believe them And whatever comfortability they used to know had now been turned upside down by the culture. And faced with this ignominious attack, Peter had the right to tell them, don't throw in the towel just because the culture has gotten left on you. Don't throw in the towel just because things have gotten hot and heavy, even though it's not based on truth, but it's based on a falsehood. It is that Kairos time, that moment of spiritual attack, that moment 
of cultural deluge against the faith, even though based on a lie, that leads Peter to write 1 Peter and to cause him to say, it's now time. When you're going through rough times, when you're going through tough times, when your faith is being rejected, when you are being persecuted, that Kairos time is not just cultural circumstances. He says it's time for judgment to start in the house of God first. Now stick with me. There is cultural attack. He says, while you're going through this Kairos moment of cultural attack, simultaneous to that time is the judgment of God taking place in the church first. He says, I know you're reading the newspaper. I know you're listening to national and local news, but I don't want you so fixated on what is happening around you that you miss what God is trying to do with you. It's now time, a Kairos moment, for judgment to start in the house of God first. You and I today are living in a Kairos moment. You are living now in a moment, as we shared in our series on truth, in a post-Christian culture. You and I are now living at a time when the clearer you are about your faith, the more abuse you're going to be receiving. You are living in a time where if you decide to be a full-time Christian and not a part-time saint, if you decide that you're going to be a visible, verbal follower of Christ, the crowd is not going to agree with you. You are living in a time when you reject the moral standards of the culture, when you reject efforts to pull people apart, when you reject evolution, when you reject a non-Christian worldview, when you reject what the culture has deemed to be legitimate and accepted, when you reject abortion, when you reject what the Bible clearly says, when you reject, when that is a Kairos moment, because the town is burning. And what Peter wants you to know, if you're going to take your stand with Jesus Christ, while the circumstances of the culture are working against you, God is bringing judgment in the church. What is the purpose of the judgment of God if the problem is I'm being unjustly treated because of what's happening around me with the neuronic appetite of secularism encroaching on the kingdom of God. Because the judgment of God in the midst of a Kairos moment is designed to show who's for real and who's fake news. Because you can be in church and be fake. You can carry your Bible and be fake. You can sing the hymns and be fake. So when God allows the culture to come against you, it is designed to reveal who the real saints are and not who the churchified folk are. He says, it's now time for the judgment of God to be revealed. So while Satan, Nero, is bringing pressure against the church, God will use that as an opportunity to reveal his true church. 
So my question is, are we going to be the real deal or are we going to be a fake congregation? Are you going to take your stand for Jesus Christ or are you just going to carry the title? There are a lot of folk who wear wedding bands who aren't even married. And there are a lot of Christians who call themselves Christians who aren't even saved. So it is now time. It's a Kairos moment. We live in a day of cancel culture. We live in a day when the Christian voice is attempting to be muted. We live in a day in this Kairos moment where the secularism of society is trying to deny the embassy for staying intact. But I'm here to declare to you that it is now not time to abandon the premises. It is now not time to abandon the faith it is now not time to abandon the word. It is now not time to abandon our savior. In love, with kindness, there must be crystal clear clarity. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he says, I'm writing to you and to the household of faith because you ought to be the ground and pillar of the truth. When everything else is shaky, there ought to be one solid foundation. When folk don't know which way to go, there ought to be one place they can look to say those folk don't move. They don't move because they moving over here and they moving over there. No, we are ground and pillar. We are ground zero because when stuff get bad enough out there, they're going to be looking for an embassy to run into. And that means that we have still got to be on the premises. So when God allows the Kairos moment in the culture, it becomes a judgment moment in the church to call us to account, to call us to a new level of commitment and to reveal where we are falling short so that we can shore it up. This is not a time to run. This is not a time for spiritual punks. This is not a time for spiritual chumps. This is a time for bibliocentric clarity in the midst of cultural confusion. He tells them that when God was getting ready to judge in the book of Ezekiel, chapter nine, verse five and six, he says, I want you to judge the city, but I first want you to start with the sanctuary. He says, because if I can't get them right, where will the unrighteous stand? When there is a Kairos moment, it typically precedes a divine intervention. When God allows stuff to go crazy, it is because something is on the horizon regarding him doing something bigger than the church. So he's got to make sure he has a church who is going to hold down the fort in the midst of cultural confusion and crisis. Now he speaks throughout this book about the struggles that they were going through. For example, he says in chapter one, verse six of first Peter and seven, in this you greatly rejoice, even though for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials that the proof of your faith, are you just talking? Are you just saying amen, hallelujah, because you're supposed to? That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus shows up, will you still be on your post? When Jesus shows up, will your faith have, have been genuine? Then he goes on and he says in chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, 
Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, set in the fire, that they, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. He says, while everybody out there is being bad, you need to be good. He says, while everybody out there is cheating, you ought to be honest. While everybody out there is going crazy, you ought to be orderly. He says, by what you show in the midst of a bad world that's gone left, folk ought to know you're not part of the crowd. You and I should be walking out of step with the culture because we're listening to a different drum beat. We're listening to a different sound. And so we're walking at a different pace. And so he is calling on Christians, he says, in spite of their slander, in spite of them coming against you, he says, you hold your fort and you declare. I love what he says in Philippians chapter one, when he talks to them and he says in verse 28, he says, in no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Now, I know we want to hear messages about blessing. I know we want to hear messages about favor. I know we want to hear messages about God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I want, know we want to hear messages about how he healed me how he blessed me, how he provided for me, how he delivered me. And there are plenty of those messages throughout the scripture. But the message we don't want to hear, the message we don't prefer, but that is replete throughout the scripture, is that the more public you become as a Christian in a secular environment, the more adversity you're going to face. Now, some of us are not going to face adversity because nobody's going to know we're Christian. Some of us are not going to be rejected because folk won't know we belong to the Savior. Some of us are not going to be criticized because there'll be nothing to criticize because we're so much like the culture. But in a Kairos time, when the world is canceling you, when they are rejecting you, not because you are being that way, just because they don't like you and they don't want you. Now is the time to be identified as a Christian and to say, I'm not only praising God for my blessing, but I'm also going to give him glory in my suffering if it's coming because of my commitment to him. This is a Kairos moment that we are facing in our culture. All this political divide and racial divide and health issues. You, people, think, people think the Delta virus is just a new strain of, of virus coming from the COVID-19 reality. Well, that's, that's just a medical explanation. But from a theological, spiritual, biblical explanation. God is keeping the flip the script. He's keeping the change things. Because he's going to see, are you still going to worship me? Are you still going to glorify me? Are you still going to praise me? When stuff keeps flipping in a Kairos moment. You've got to understand what we're going through spiritually and theologically, not just medically, culturally, racially, politically, and societally. And so he says, it is time. It is time that you take your stand. Proverbs eleven thirty one. 31, it is with difficulty the righteous is saved. If that's true, what will become of the sinner? 
if God is going to send us through a rough time and we believe in him, what you think will happen to folk who reject him? Our God is a consuming fire. And you need to know about that side so when you run into hard times, you don't throw in the towel. And I'm not talking about, he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, these words. He says, verse 15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Now he's speaking governmentally because if you murder somebody, you, you know, the government puts you in jail or sentence you if you be caught as a thief or an evildoer. He makes an interesting word here, a troublesome meddler. I think this is the only time this, this Greek word is used in the whole New Testament. That means a, a political agitator. A, a troublesome meddler is a, because he's speaking governmentally, it's a, it's a f folk who stir stuff up to make stuff worse. Okay? They bring conflict in the culture. They don't bring reconciliation and healing. They bring chaos and conflict and they get on the microphone to keep stuff stirred up. Not to make it better, but to make it worse. He says, don't be named among those who not trying to help, but just trying to keep things messed up and toe up from the flow up. He says, no, 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 that's not how I want, I want you to be named. He says, and I love verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Okay, in what name? In the name of being a Christian. Okay, let me tell you something that you, you may not know. The name Christian is not a name Christians gave to themselves. Christians didn't call themselves Christians. That's not how we got the name Christian. Christian was first used in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It says, and when the disciples gathered, they were called Christians at Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. The folk in Antioch called them Christians. And they called them Christians, he says, because they were disciples. So it was their discipleship that made folk identify them as Christians. A disciple is not merely a person who's accepted Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and the free gift of eternal life. A disciple is somebody who's gone public with their faith and their identification, not with belief in God, but association with Jesus Christ. If they're, so because they were so visibly associated with Jesus Christ, they were called Christians. So you only got to be called Christians because you look like a disciple. See, some folk want to be called Christians because they go to church. Some folks are called Christians because they call themselves Christians. But the question in the book of Acts is are you so much a follower of Christ that other folk call you Christians and you ain't said a word? Because how you are functioning, how you are rolling, how you are acting, how you are walking, how you are talking, is so much like Jesus, they got to call you Christian. The word Christian is also used in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, because Agrippa said to Paul, you, you got this Jesus thing so strong, if you keep this up, you're going to make me become a Christian. And he uses the word, that wasn't Paul saying I'm a Christian. That was a pagan king, a pagan ruler, saying you got this Jesus thing so strong thick on you. You so wrapped up, tied up, and bundled up in Jesus. If you keep this up, you're going to turn me out. You're going to make me become a follower of Christ. So he says it's time. In this Kairos moment, this moment of confusion, this moment of chaos. Well, what, what do you want me to do? What, what if they, if they start talking about me on my job, not because I'm creating havoc, but because I'm such a good worker, yeah. 
because I don't steal time or substance from the boss. Because I am faithful in what I do, because I, I keep my, my responsibility, if they, if they reject me, if they, whatever it is, he, said, he says, uh, here's what I want you to do. He says it in verse 13. He says, uh, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Ooh. Ooh. He says, if you take your stand for Jesus, lovingly, responsibly, kindly, but clearly, if you take your stand for Jesus, I want you to rejoice. I want you to get your praise on. Wait a minute. People talking about me, they're insulting me, they're rejecting me, they're firing me. Folk don't want to marry me, whatever it is. But, you know, I, 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 keep, I, keep my, I keep my stand for Jesus. He says, I want you to get your joy on. I want you to rejoice. Priscilla was telling me the other day that, that she heard, I don't know what the mechanism was, but she heard from a, a, a pastoral leader in Afghanistan. And the leader said, we probably only have two weeks to live. Me and my congregation, we only have a couple of weeks to live. When the Taliban finds us, it is most likely they're going to kill us. But we are going to stand firm with Christ. We are not afraid. And we're looking forward to seeing Jesus in two weeks. And you complaining about somebody talking about you? You complaining about somebody may not like you. You complaining that nobody, you, you're not getting favor from somebody. And these folk are praising, knowing that there's the great possibility they're going to be slain in two weeks. Now you know why God gets ticked off when he hears folk complaining who ought to be giving thanks. He says, I want you to rejoice because you were viewed so much like Jesus that folk were against you. That's good news when folk are against you because you are for Christ. He says, rejoice. Hold your ground. Keep your stand. In fact, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, he says, there's a double blessing. He says, when you're persecuted for your faith, not because you look for persecution, not because you're searching for persecution, but because you're looking so much like Jesus and you are not ashamed. In fact, he says here in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 4, he lets you know that there is blessing that comes with serving Christ. In fact, chapter 3, he says, not returning, verse 9, evil for evil, or insult for insult, okay? I know they did what they did to you is wrong, and you know, you the man and all that, and you want to you give them a PCO Christian mind and all that. He says, not returning evil for evil or returning insult for insult. That doesn't mean that you don't tell the truth, that you don't give a legitimate defense, but he's talking about retribution. But giving, but giving a blessing instead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's convicting, isn't it? Well, he cussed me out. I ain't let nobody cuss me out like that. I, I know a few words myself. He says, oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, because the goal is to be like Jesus. So giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, when you're in this Kairos moment of conflict, and God's trying to show who's real and who's not real. He says, when they come against you, I don't want you to do retribution. No, I want you to give a blessing. Why would I bless somebody who's insulting me? Why would I bless somebody who's against me? I'm not going to ignore the truth. I'm not going to just say I'm wrong if I'm not wrong. But how do I 
bless a racist who's being a racist toward me? How do I bless when they come again? Why am I going to do that? He says, because when you do that, you will inherit a blessing. In other words, he says, when you get favor, when you give favor, you get favor. See, God can't help a lot of us because we just like the sinners that are against us. So why is he going to bless us so we can be more like them than more like him? He says, I want you to be a blessing. Verse 14 of chapter 3. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. He says, when they come against you, I want you to tell them why you're acting the way you are, why you're talking the way you talk, why you're loving the way you love, why you're caring the way you care, why you're not doing to them what they did to you. He says, sanctify Christ in your heart and do it with the right spirit so that you can experience God's favor coming on your life. And so... Have you ever seen anybody driving in two lanes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're driving down the middle of the street. Right. Yeah. You don't know whether they want to go right or left because they, they sway in back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got too many two-lane Christians. See, they, they want to drive in the middle of the road. See, they want, they want, they want, they want, when it's convenient, they want Jesus. When it's inconvenient, they want the world. Uh, but now they want Jesus. And sometimes they want Jesus and the world. They just, they just be driving down. God is looking for some folk who are going to stay on the right side and take their stand with Jesus. Now, we're not perfect. We have our flaws. We have our failures. But when you find out you're on the wrong side of the road, you don't stay there. You get back on where you belong. You get back on the straight and narrow. So as we are enduring our Kairos moment, yeah, 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 yeah. I want you and me and us to be known in the marketplace of our lives, home, community, work, civic engagement, racial connectivity. I want us to be known as disciples so other folk can call us Christians. So other folk can say, y'all are different over there. So other folk can say, y'all not ordinary, y'all function in a whole different, so that they begin, he says in chapter three, to ask some questions. When they ask questions, why you talk like that? Why you act like that? Why, 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 why you not doing what we do? Why you not going where we go? Why you not cussing like we cuss? How come you aren't like us? And then he says, then, then you sanctify the Lord Christ in your heart. You get ready. When they ask the question, you say, okay, Lord, give me the words because it's you and me right now. It's you and me right now. And you make your declaration clear that I take my stand with Jesus Christ. The world's going to throw dirt on you because we are in a Kairos moment. We're in a post-Christian era. This is not your mama's country when it comes to faith. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, my teachers had faith in the public school. So they communicated, even if they weren't necessarily formal Christians, they shared a Judeo-Christian framework for life and family and decency. Well, that's gone. That's, that's gone. It's gone governmentally. It's gone in media. It's gone in education. It's gone. Okay? Now, by God's grace, we pray for it to come back, but right now it's that Kairos moment and the city is burning. So the question is, you, your family, our church, where are you going to stand? Are you going to be not a church goer, but a visible, verbal follower of Christ, especially when they throw in dirt? when they throw in dirt. A dog one day fell in a, a well. 
The dog one day fell in the well and it was a deep well. Yeah. And the owner, the farmer was so sad he lost his dog in the well. But it was so deep he yeah. couldn't go get him so he, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll just bury him in the well. So he started taking dirt and throwing it in the well. He started taking dirt and throwing it in the well. He started taking dirt because he wanted to bury him, throw him in the dirt. But the dog wasn't dead. But the farmer didn't know it because it was so deep. So every time the farmer threw dirt, the dog stepped on the dirt. The farmer kept throwing dirt. The dog stepped on the dirt. The farmer kept throwing dirt. The dog kept stepping on the dirt. Tell when the farmer filled the well up with dirt, the dog walked out. The culture at this Kairos moment wants to bury you. But if you name the name of Jesus Christ, when they throw dirt, you step up and you declare who you are. You and I are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. You stay faithful to him. You walk with him. You declare him. You follow him. You fight for him with love and kindness, but with clarity so that at this church and in your life, we are known as disciples of Jesus Christ, not because we say it, but because they see it. That's what we've been called to do in this Kairos moment.